This talk is about sensory and cerebellar examinations. These are the class objectives. You do not need to read them. We will use them to chart our talk. So let's start. It is important, probably more important than in any other segment of the neurological examination that you explain and confirm understanding of each procedure prior to testing. Since the patient's eyes must be closed during most procedures to avoid false results. It is also important that as you administer each test, you be thinking about the purpose of the test and the anatomical area surveyed by the specific procedures. Why is anatomy and physiology important? Because the end game of the sensory examination is to establish if the exam is normal or abnormal, that is, if a sensory deficit is present, in which case we must establish the distribution of the deficit, whether it affects a single nerve, which suggests a compression neuropathy, or multiple nerves arising from the same plexus, suggesting a plexopathy, or from multiple nerves arising from different plexi, suggesting a mononeuropathy multiplex. Whether the deficit has a root distribution suggesting a radiculopathy, whether the deficit is present in a single limb or multiple limbs on the same or the opposite sides. The sensory examination must also establish the modality or modalities involved in a given area. The sensory examination must establish the presence of dissociation between modalities affected, which may indicate a nerve lesion or a spinal cord compression. And lastly, but not less important, to establish the presence of a well-defined or ill-defined border to the lesion. Hence, the first part of this talk will deal with anatomy and physiology. We will then talk about tools and techniques for sensory examination and provide some clinical correlations. Sensory examination surveys three areas. The first area is conscious sensations, gathered by body surface receptors. The survey of this modality is done by mapping cutaneous regions for the different sensory modalities. The second area is conscious joint sensation and muscle sensation. This is done by testing position sense and motion sense and the third is non-conscious joint sensation and muscle sensation. This is done by performing the following procedures. Finger to nose test, heel to shin test, and by evaluating the patient's balance while standing with feet together as shown in this frame. These three procedures are performed with the eyes closed to prevent visual cues leading to false results. The need to evaluate these three areas, conscious body surface sensation, conscious joint and muscle sensation, and non-conscious joint and muscle sensations, directs that the sensory examination be conducted in three parts. Body surface sensory examination, conscious joint and muscle sensory examination, and unconscious joint and muscle testing. Body surface examination and conscious joint muscle examination will be addressed simultaneously. Unconscious sensation will be addressed last. As previously stated, sensory examination of the body surface has traditionally been conducted by mapping regions of the skin based on dermatomes, nerve territories, and core territories. The core territories are usually mapped in the upper extremity and not in the lower extremity. This is probably so because the greater variability of lower extremity core fields. Dermatomes are areas of body innervated by branches of a single spinal nerve or a single branch of the trigeminal nerve. 
In this talk, we will only concern ourselves with the former. This figure is a sensory dermatoma map. I like to represent the dermatoma map in this position, bent forward, to remind myself that the toes are innervated by a spinal nerve of more rostral origin than those innervating the butt and because we can clearly see the distinction of the trigeminal nerve dermatomes, the junction between the trigeminal area and the second cervical dermatome, in other words, the absence of a C1 dermatome reflecting the absence of a first cervical spinal root ganglion in most individuals, the location of the fourth thoracic spinal dermatome at the level of the nipple, and the location of the 10th thoracic dermatome at the level of the umbilicus. One thing bad with representing dermatomes in this position is that the second sacral dermatome appears to be limited to the butt, when in reality, as represented here in this standing position, the second sacral dermatome extends from the sacral area to the feet. The standing position representation of the dermatome is as this one, this one, and this one, the one most commonly used position to show the dermatoma distribution, especially when dealing with upper level of cord lesions. Less traditional positions have also been used as the one you are looking at in this frame. Notice the orderly arrangement of the cervical dermatome nicely represented in this view. Now I will talk specifically about the innervation of the upper extremity, starting with a more thorough look at dermatomes. This is a representation of the upper spine, the brachial plexus, and the ventral ramus of C4 and T2. The ventral ramus of C4 is the anterior or ventral split of the C4 spinal nerve. This ramus supplies fibers corresponding to C4 dermatome in the arm. The C4 dermatome in the upper limb is only present anteriorly. It occupies a cutaneous strip at the junction between the arm and the trunk. The arrow indicates the ventral ramus of C5. The ventral ramus of C5 provides fiber corresponding to the fifth cervical dermatome in the arm. The area of the C5 dermatome is represented by the green strip. Notice that the C5 dermatome in this map does not reach beyond the wrist, yet in other maps the area of the fifth dermatome extends to the palmar side of the thumb. Also notice that C5 dermatome is not present in the dorsal aspect of the arm. Fibers from the sixth ventral ramus correspond to the sixth dermatome in the arm. This dermatome occupies the region bordering the lateral aspect of the upper limb and hand. As you can see here in the arm, here in the forearm, and in the hand. In the hand, C6 dermatome corresponds to the region of the thumb. C7 ventral ramus, indicated here, occupies a large band in the dorsal aspect of the arm and hand, but anteriorly the seventh dermatome is only present in the hand. Notice that C7 innervates the middle finger. Lateral to C7 dermatome is C6 dermatome and medial to the C7 dermatome is C8 dermatome. Fibers from the C8 ventral ramus corresponds to the C8 dermatome in the arm. The C8 dermatome occupies a strip going from the shoulder to the ring and little finger. And in the anterior aspect of the arm, from just below the axilla to the fingers, as shown in this figure. The territorial arrangement of C8 is similar to the territorial arrangement 
of C6, but on the medial side. T1 ventral ramus corresponds to the T1 dermatom. This dermatom can be viewed best in the anterior aspect of the upper limb. Again, as C5 dermatom, T1 dermatom in this map does not reach the hand, and small area of T1 can be seen in the upper dorsal aspect of the arm. The T2 ventral ramus corresponding to T2 dermatome in the arm occupies a small area in the axilla. We have finished talking about upper extremity dermatomes. We will now move to nerve territories. The somatosensory innervation of the arm is carried out by nine nerves. The supracavicular nerve, the intercostobrachial nerve, superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, radial nerve, median nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and the ulnar nerve. Have no fear, we will address each nerve separately and only mention one or two important facts about each of them. We will start by talking about the supraclavicular nerve. The supraclavicular nerve arises from the cervical plexus. I have added a representation of the cervical plexus in this frame. The supraclavicular nerve arises from C3 and C4 fibers, specifically from the loop formed by these fibers. This nerve is best viewed in the neck on the lateral side and posteriorly, as indicated by the arrow. In this frame, I have reintroduced the cervical plexus and I have traced in a magenta line the fibers that contribute to the supracavicular nerve. The territory supplied by this nerve in the upper extremity is the trunk arm junction. Anteriorly. The second nerve I want to mention to you is the intercostal brachial nerve. The intercostal brachial nerve arises from T2. The intercostal brachial nerve supplies a small area in the axilla, indicated in this frame. The third nerve is a superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The fibers of the superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm travel with the fibers of the axillary nerve. You can see them trace in the brachial plexus figure. Anteriorly, the superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm supplies the area of the skin above the anterior and anterior half of the medial deltoid muscle. Posteriorly, the superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm supplies the area of the skin overlying the posterior deltoid and the posterior half of the medial deltoid muscle. This picture is from a patient I saw many years ago. He had no pinprick sensation in the delineated area. He also had muscle atrophy in several scapular muscles, as you can see. The next nerve I will mention is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm is a branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. The fibers of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm are traced in this frame. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm innervates the area indicated here. Anteriorly, the region extends from the radial border of the forearm to the midline of the forearm. Dorsally, the territory continues from the radial lateral border of the forearm for about a third of the distance to the ulnar border. The fifth nerve I want to mention to you is the radial nerve. The cutaneous branches of the radial nerve are four. The posterior brachial cutaneous nerve of the arm supplies a small area of the dorsal arm. This nerve arises from the ventral ramus of C7 and C8. Its fiber travel with the motor fibers 
of the radial nerve, but they depart from the radial nerve main trunk at the upper arm. The next branch of the radial nerve is the lower lateral brachial cutaneous nerve. This nerve supplies a relatively large area of the posterior arm. The fibers for the lower lateral brachial cutaneous nerve arise from C6, C7, and C8. The next cutaneous branch of the radial nerve is the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve. The area supplied by this nerve is shown in this frame. Fibers from this nerve also arise from C6, C7, and C8. The last cutaneous branch of the radial nerve is called the superficial branch of the radial nerve. The superficial branch of the radial nerve in the dorsal aspect of the arm supplies the area indicated in this frame. This area, especially at the root of the thumb, is consistently innervated by the radial nerve. The fibers of the superficial branch of the radial nerve arise from C6 and C7. The superficial branch of the radial nerve is represented over the anterior aspect of the hand as you can see in this frame. After the radial nerve, we will address the median nerve. The median nerve only innervates cutaneous territory in the hand. Its fibers come from C5 and C6, although according to some, only from C6, advocating that C5 dermatome stops at the wrist. Anteriorly, the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve innervates the area corresponding to the root of the thumb. This area is consistently innervated by the median nerve. The second cutaneous branch of the median nerve is called the digital branch of the median nerve. The digital branches of the median nerve innervate the territory of the palm of the hand and fingers indicated in this frame. Over the dorsal region, the median nerve innervates the skin of the middle and distal phalange of the index and middle finger, as well as the radial side of the ring finger in the same distribution, as indicated in this frame. It is clinically important to remember that the skin over the root of the thumb, here indicated by the arrow head is innervated by the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve and that this branch does not get in the hand through the carpal tunnel, whereas the fibers of the digital branches of the median nerve innervating the rest of the median nerve territory in the hand go through the carpal tunnel. After the median nerve, we will address the median cutaneous nerve of the arm. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm branches from the medial cord. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm gets its fiber from T1. These fibers travel side by side with the ulnar nerve fibers, but exit the medial cord before the medial cord provides the branch to join the median nerve. The area innervated by the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm is located over the medial side of the arm, as indicated in this frame. After the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, we will talk about the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm innervates a rather large area of the arm and forearm. It arises from C8 and T1 spinal nerve. Its fiber follow the same trajectory as the fibers for the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, but they exit the medial cord more distally. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm innervates a large portion of the ulnar side of the forearm. Its anterior territory extends to the lower part of the arm. After the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, 
I will say a few words regarding the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve cutaneous fibers arise from C8. The ulnar nerve innervates a segment of the palmar and the dorsal hand. The ulnar nerve has three cutaneous sensory branches. The palmar digital branch, the dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve, and the superficial digital branch of the ulnar nerve. The names of these branches, the territory they innervate, and the most important anatomical points related to these branches are presented in this frame. The palmar branch of the ulnar nerve departs from the ulnar nerve prior to it reaching the carpal bones. And the territory it supplies is color match in this figure. The second branch of the ulnar nerve I want to talk to you about is the dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve. The departure of this nerve from the ulnar nerve occurs prior to the ulnar nerve reaching the carpal area and the territory it innervates is indicated and color matched. The third ulnar branch is, as we have already mentioned, the superficial digital branch of the ulnar nerve. This is the terminal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. This branch goes through the carpal bony canal in order to reach the hand and the territory it supply is also depicted in this frame. With the discussion of the ulnar nerve, we have concluded the review of the cutaneous innervation of the arm. So we have reviewed the upper extremity dermatomes, upper extremity nerve territories, and we will now address brachial plexus call territories. The emphasis on cutaneous mapping of the brachial plexus cord stem from the frequency they are injured and on the fact that they are little more complicated to deduce than the fields produced by trunk involvement. Field deficit produced by trunk injury can be easily deduced considering the dermatomal innervation. Core field approximate nerve territories as we will see in the next few minutes. The brachial plexus cords are labeled lateral, posterior, and medial based on their relation to the axillary artery. The lateral cord sensory fibers innervates the territory of the median nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve as shown in this figure. The posterior cord supplies the combined territories innervated by the superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm and the radial nerve. The medial cord area of innervation consists of the territories of the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and ulnar nerve. We have concluded talking about upper extremity anatomy required to perform a sensory examination of the upper extremity. Now we are going to talk about cutaneous innervation of the lower extremity. We will consider two anatomical elements, dermatomes and nerve territories. We will start with dermatomes. This is a representation of the lumbosacral spine and the lumbosacral plexus. I have now numbered the vertebras as you can see, and in this frame added the medial anterior view of the leg and drawn and labeled the dermatomes. Notice the left to right ordering of L2 and L3 and the inverse order of L4 and L5. This is the consequence of the normal torsion of the fetal leg that occurs between five and seven weeks of intrauterine life. I have now added a medial posterior lateral view of the leg. Notice the location of S2 and S1. The territory of these dermatomes extend from the sacral region to the foot. 
also notice that L5 dermatome innervates a large area in the dorsal aspect of the foot. I have now included the bottom of the foot in this frame. The colors match the dermatomes listed for the leg. In this frame, I have placed an arrow indicating the location and direction of the maneuver required to elicit the Babinski reflex. Notice that it primarily involves S1 and L5 dermatomes. Before abandoning the subject of dermatomes, it is important to say that there is a great variability in dermatome mapping in anatomical textbooks. This is so because there is a great variability among patients. We will now start talking about nerve territories of the lower extremity. The leg is innervated by 10 nerves. We will briefly talk about each of them. We will start with the genitofemoral nerve. The genitofemoral nerve is actually the third nerve of the upper lumbar plexus. The iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal being the other two. The genitofemoral nerve carries fiber from L1 and L2. I have now added the region supplied by the femoral component of this nerve. This area is important because stroking it, as indicated in this picture, triggers the cremasteric reflex. The cremasteric reflex consists of ipsilateral elevation of the scrotum. This reflex is usually present from 30 months to 12 years of age. Next nerve is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is the first nerve of the lower lumbar plexus. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is distributed over the lateral aspect of the thigh as indicated in this frame. Compression of this nerve produces meradial parasthetica, a painful condition usually caused by wearing too tight belt at the waist. Next, we will talk about the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve is the second nerve of the lower lumbar plexus. It arises from fibers from L2, L3, and L4. The femoral nerve has three cutaneous branches. The medial and intermediate femoral nerves supply the anterior aspect of the thigh, and the third branch called the saphenous nerve. The saphenous nerve innervates the medial aspect of the foreleg all the way down to the foot. The next nerve I would like to mention is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. This nerve arises from S1 to S3 fibers. It innervates the posterior aspect of the leg and by one of its branches, named the inferior clunian nerve, it innervates the gluteal region indicated by the arrow. The posterior femoral nerve also has perineal branches. These branches contribute to the innervation of the peroneal region, as we will see later in conjunction with the pudendal nerve. In this view, we can also see the region innervated by the inferior cluneal nerve. The next nerve we will talk about is the obturator nerve. The obturator nerve is the third nerve of the lower lumbar plexus. The obturator nerve supplies the skin over the middle region of the leg. Next we will talk about the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve here indicated by the arrow is made of fibers from L4 to S3. The sciatic nerve supplies all the foreleg and foot area except for the areas supplied by the saphenous nerve. The areas supplied by the sciatic nerve include the territories innervated by the lateral sural nerve, the medial sural nerve, the superficial peroneal nerve, the deep peroneal nerve, and the medial calcaneus. When it comes to the foot, the sciatic nerve territories include the area supplied by the lateral and medial plantar nerves, the lateral and medial calcaneus nerves, and the sural nerve. 
So far, we have represented the fibers of the sciatic nerve and the lumbosacral plexus contributing to the sciatic nerve in one color, yellow. Here, we have used two colors, blue to represent the anterior components and red to represent the posterior components. This was done in preparation for the explanations that will follow. Next, we will talk about the tibial nerve, but before we do so, it is important to know of the existence of pre-tibial nerve branches. This term refers to branches from the same spinal nerves and anterior divisions that form the tibial nerve that leave the main trunk before the tibial nerve actually forms. These pretibial nerves represented here by the two little blue trunks are simply called nerve 2, the muscle they innervate. The superior trunk indicated in this frame by the arrow supplies the obturator internus and the superior gemellus. The lower trunk here indicated send fibers to the quadratus femoris and the inferior gemellus. The importance of the pretibial nerve is that if affected in a patient with a tibial nerve deficit, it indicates a lesion proximal to the origin of the tibial nerve. This is illustrated in the next frame. This frame relates the story of a child with suspected tibial nerve lesion in whom an MRI of the pelvis revealed involvement of the obturator internus, thus localizing the lesion to the lumbar plexus or above and not to the sciatic nerve or the tibial nerve as it was initially considered. Now we are going to talk about the tibial nerve proper. The tibial nerve is represented in this frame in blue indicated by the arrow. The blue structure above depict fibers from the anterior division of the lumbar plexus that contribute to the formation of the tibial nerve or the pretrivial trunks. The sensory territory of the tibial nerve corresponds anteriorly to the areas innervated by the lateral sural nerve, the medial sural nerve, medial calcaneus, and in the posterior lateral region of the leg to the area innervated by the lateral sural nerve and lateral calcaneus nerve. In the plantar region of the foot, the tibial nerve branches into the lateral and medial plantar nerves as depicted in this frame. I will now mention some prevalent points about the superficial peroneal nerve. Again, as we did for the tibial nerve, I will first mention the nerves or trunks that arise from the same fibers as the superficial peroneal nerve prior to its formation. These nerves will be referred to as pre-common peroneal nerves. They can be referred so because they arise prior to the formation of the common peroneal nerve, whose division form the superficial and deep peroneal nerves. The pre-common peroneal nerves are the superior gluteal nerve, the inferior gluteal nerve, the nerve to the piriform, and a distal branch, not shown here, that innervates the short head of the bicep femoris. Now, going on to the superficial peroneal nerve, we can say that this nerve supplies the dorsal aspect of the foot. Notice that the superficial peroneal nerve does not innervate between the first and second toe. I will now mention the deep peroneal nerve just to say that the deep peroneal nerve innervates the area between the first and the second toe. The last nerve we will talk about is the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve arises from S2, S3, and S4. The pudendal nerve cutaneous branches are the dorsal nerve of the penis or clitoris, the posterior scrotal or labial nerve, 
the perineal nerve and the inferior rectal nerve. This is a view of the perineal area. I am showing it here to indicate the area innervated by the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve, as we have just heard, gives off the dorsal penis or clitoris nerve. The area it supplies is signaled by the arrow. The posterior scotoral labial nerve territory is indicated by the just introduced arrows. The third nerve arising from the pudendal nerve is the peroneal nerve. The area supplied by this nerve is indicated by the arrows. The fourth branch is the inferior rectal nerve. This nerve innervates the external rectal sphincter and the surrounding skin. We have now finished talking about the cutaneous innervation of the lower extremities. And we will start talking about the mechanics of sensory examination. I will first talk about the tools needed and how they are used to perform a sensory examination. The tools needed for sensory examination can be grouped into two types. Regular those used during routine exams, and sp special, those used only in special circumstances. Among regular tools, we have the turning forks. Turning forks are used to test vibration sense. As you see display in this frame, turning forks come in many sizes, but what is important is the number written prior to the prongs. This number indicates the oscillation per second produced by a given fork, once activated by tapping the distal most region of the prongs. The one indicated here by the arrow after tapping vibrates at a frequency of 128 oscillations per second. This one vibrates at a frequency of 4096 oscillations per second. The turning fork most often used for regular somatosensory testing by most neurology I know is the one labeled 128, although the argument for using higher frequency turning forks has merit, as we will soon see. Vibration sense is tested by placing the stern of the turning fork on a bony prominence. I like to start at the metatarsal phalangeal joint of the big toe. Then, if, no, if not felt by the patient, I test the ankle and the patella. I do the same operation in the upper extremity, starting with the distal phalange of the index finger and, if necessary, going to the skin above the metacarpal bones, medial epicondyl region, and lateral epicondyl region. Finally, at times, I test at the level of the sternum. The next tool we use is our fingers. We use them to test position sense and motion sense. The next tool is the narrow tip. The narrow tip is used to test fine touch, better known as pinprick. This test must be carefully explained and care not to break the skin must be taken. Intermittently using a blunt and a sharp stimuli allows us to check that the patient understands the test and is actually feeling the pin prick and not only pressure. This method is used to evaluate the pain pathway. This test is performed by testing cutaneous area, guiding ourselves by the cutaneous map previously described. Pin prick testing is very useful to determine the margins or the upper limits of a lesion and to determine if the transition between injured and healthy territories is sharp or gradual. Gradual transition distally in the extremities is typical of neuropathy. An area of abnormal sensation must be studied from the abnormal to the normal area to better appreciate its margins. Another modality of testing is temperature. A warm object or a cold object 
can be used to test temperature. The procedure follows the same principle as pinprick testing. Light touch can be assessed with cotton tips. Testing is achieved by casing different skin regions with the cotton tip guided by the cutaneous map previously described. In addition to regular tools, special tools are often used, including two-point discrimination devices, two of which are shown here. Two-point discrimination is best at the tongue, an every performed test, and next at the fingertips. At the fingertips, two points can be recognized even as close as two millimeters apart. Other areas require longer distance to discriminate two points. Coin can be used as tools. The ability to recognize objects by handling them is called stereognosis. Recognizing an object is a complex process that includes at the periphery level not only skin receptor but also muscle and joint receptors and at central level the primary somatosensory area, unimodal and multimodal association areas in the cortex. The next tool we can use is a pencil. A pencil with a blunted tip as not to hurt the patient. This is used to write a number on the skin, let's say in the palm, while asking the patient who should have his eyes closed what number has been written. This test is called graphesthesia. A patient should be able to recognize a large or medium-sized number when written in the palm. The last tool I would like to mention is the high-frequency turning fork. The high-frequency turning fork may be a more appropriate tool to evaluate fast conducting nerve fibers than a lower frequency turning fork. What do we test with these tools? We test the sensory unit. The sensory unit consists of receptors, receptors present in the joints, receptors present in the muscle, and receptors in the skin. These receptors constitute the first structure of the sensory unit. The other structures are nerve, dorsal root ganglia sensory neurons, the predorsal root ganglion sensory structures, and a central path which includes the spine, the brainstem, the cerebellum for unconscious proprioception, and the brain for conscious sensory modalities. If we are leaving the subject of joint and muscle receptors, I'd like to mention two points. The first one, that dermatomes and myotomes do not have the same anatomical distribution. This frame depicts the difference in the arm. Notice that the skin of the thumb is innervated by fibers from the sixth cervical spinal segment, but the muscles under it are innervated by fibers from the C8 and T1 spinal segments. Hence, assessing the position sense and motion sense at the elbow provides a better assessment of this modality at the C6 spinal segment than assessing the position in motion sense at the level of the thumb. At the thumb, assessing position and motion sense reflects the well-being of C8 and T1 spinal segments. Similar comments apply to nerve territories. The second point I want to make here is that skin receptors, joint receptors, and muscle receptors seem to be very sturdy structures because they always work. Now that we know that some of the testing structures during sensory examination are receptor, we have to ask ourselves what other structures do we test during sensory examination. If you can't recall all the components of the sensory unit that we previously enumerated, you can imagine 
that many structures and pathways are tested during sensory examination. We will start by talking about nerves. This is the histological appearance of a somatic nerve. Most peripheral nerves have myelinated, some thick myelinated, others thinly myelinated, as well as non-myelinated axons. These axons are anatomically intermingled but functionally separated by the information they carry. Position sense and motion sense, vibration sense, and soft touch, especially discriminative touch, are carried by thicker myelinated fibers. Soft touch, mainly of the non-discriminative type, temperature, and pinprick is carried by thinly myelinated or non-myelinated fibers. Take a few seconds to review this frame. It gives a quick overview of the sensory modalities carried by the different fiber size. Just explain. Notice that soft touch is carried by thick and thin fibers. Discriminative soft touch by thicker fibers, non-discriminative soft touch by thinner fibers, either thinly myelinated or non-myelinated axons. In general, thinly myelinated axons are thicker than non-myelinated axons. Thick fibers carry motion sense, position sense, and vibrations. Thin fibers carry pinprick and temperature. After nerves, we should consider dorsal root ganglion sensory neurons and also the pedorsal root ganglion sensory structures. Following the trajectory of the sensory stimulus, the next structure we should consider is the spine. In the spine, you can see two lines, one light green representing conscious sensation and the other one sky blue representing non-conscious sensation. We will first address conscious sensation in the spine. The spine here represented in a specimen and now illustrated to show its variations at different spinal levels in this frame, I have selected one segment, C8, to provide an overview of the structures and pathway tested during sensory examination. Unlike in the nerve, where the different sensory modalities are intermingled, in the spine, the modalities are anatomically separated. At this level, we can see the dorsal compartment, called the posterior funiculus, the lateral funiculus and anterior funiculus separated by the angular yellow line in this frame. The posterior funiculus is occupied by the fasciculus gracilis. The fasciculus gracilis bring lower body fibers from the ipsilateral dorsal spinal ganglion sensory cells, mainly from the ipsilateral leg. And we can also find in the posterior funiculus the cuneatus fascicles, bringing upper body fibers from the ipsilateral dorsal spinal ganglion sensory cell, mainly from the arm. These fasciculi carry position sense and motion sense. Vibrations and soft touch, especially discriminative soft touch. The axons in these neurons end at the gracilis and cuneatus at the lower medulla. The neurons at these nuclei are the second neurons of the sensory unit involved in transmission of position sense, vibration sense, and discriminative touch. This system is called the dorsal column pathway or the dorsal medial lemniscus pathway. Now I am going to talk to you about another system called the spinothalamic system. The anterior part of the lateral funiculus carries conscious 
sensation. Here represented in green, the modalities carried here are soft touch, sense, especially non-discriminative, cold sense, warm sense, and pinprick. In the anterior fornicules, we find fibers that carry soft touch sense mainly of the non-discriminative type. The fibers in the lateral funiculus and in the anterior funiculus correspond to the contralateral part of the body and are axons of neurons found in dorsal horn in the opposite side of the cord. These neurons are the second neurons of the spinothalamic tracts also called the anterior lateral system or pathway. Again, take a few minutes to view this figure. It summarizes the trajectory of the different modalities of conscious senses in the spine. Notice the similarities between this figure and the figure for nerves. But also notice that the separation in the spine is regional. I am showing the sensory unit figure again to point out that we have talked about conscious sensation in the spine and now we will address non-conscious sensations. This is a representation of the conscious sensation fibers and the different modalities they carry. I have now added the spinocerebellar tract. This tract occupies the rim of the lateral funiculus. It carries fibers that ultimately enter the cerebellum, bringing ipsilateral and contralateral information. These fibers carry non-conscious sensation from muscle and joints and are tested during finger-to-nose test with eyes closed, heel-to-shin test with eyes closed, and standing with feet together with eyes closed. The maneuver here shown is called the Romberg test. When the patient does not sway with eyes open, but sways once the eyes are closed, we talked about a positive Romberg. A positive Romberg indicates normal cerebellar function, but an abnormal nerve or spine pathway bringing unconscious proprioception or vestibular dysfunction. Positive Romberg test is more specific for abnormal nerve or spinal cord unconscious proprioception than for vestibular pathology. Abnormal finger to nose and heel to shin tests with eyes closed and normal with eyes opening indicates abnormal unconscious proprioception and is further evidence of normal vestibular function. Those supporting nerve pathology a spinal pathology or both. After the spine, the next structure we evaluate during sensory examination is the brain stem. We will first address conscious sensation of position sense, motion sense, vibration sense, and light or soft touch, especially discriminative soft touch sub modalities, as well as esterognosis in graphesthesia. These modalities in the spine travel in the dorsal column, in the fasciculus cuneatus, those for the arm are indicated here. Upon reaching the lower medulla, the axons of the dorsal ganglion neurons carrying these modalities end at the cuneatus nucleus where the second neuron of the dorsal system, also called the dorsal column medial lemniscus, lives. The axons from these second neurons send fibers to the opposite side of the medulla, forming the internal arcuate fascicle, which after crossing the midline go up as the medial lemniscus. The fibers of the medial lemniscus ascend through the upper medulla pons and midbrain going towards the thalamus. 
we have just explained the dorsal lateral pathway for the upper body shown here now we will talk about the fibers carrying same modalities from the lower body these fibers follow a similar trajectory the only difference is that they travel in the gracilis fascicle and they make contact with neurons in the gracilis nucleus the pathway of the upper and lower body for these modalities of sensation is called as we have previously mentioned the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway what about other conscious sensory modalities conscious modalities tested by pinprick temperature and non-discriminative soft touch follow a different trajectory as a consequence of their different spinal arrangement you recall that unlike the fibers in the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway that do not make contact in the dorsal horn and ascend it laterally as depicted here fibers carrying pinprick temperature and non-discriminative soft touch soon after entering the spine come in contact with the second neuron in the dorsal horn the axons of these dorsal horn neurons cross in the anterior region of the spine to form the lateral spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract this crossing is of great clinical importance because a lesion in the mid anterior region of the spine as depicted here will impair temperature pinprick and non-discriminative touch but will spare position sense vibration sense and discriminative touch now let's go back to the spinothalamic tract as they ascend in the brain stem to comment on another consequence of the crossing of fibers destined to form the spinothalamic tract at the spine and that is that they are joined by the axons from the neurons from the gracilis and cuneatus nuclei belonging to the dorsolateral lemniscus system at the level of the upper medulla and lower pons this junction has great clinical significance lesions above this junction involve all sensory modalities in the same side of the body as depicted in this frame central nervous system lesions below this junction produce hemibody sensory modality dissociation as depicted in this frame notice that position sense motion sense and vibration sense are affected on one side and temperature and pinprick in the other as you can see in this frame and you saw in the prior frame this is so in the presence of unilateral lesions next in the chain of a structure tested during the evaluation of sensory conscious modalities is the thalamus the thalamus here represented consists of a relatively large structure that has many nuclei as you can see in this frame the one involved with conscious sensation of the body is the ventroposterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus all conscious sensation from the limbs and from the trunk reach the ventroposterior lateral nucleus where the third neuron of the conscious sensation pathway is at the axon of the neuron in the ventroposterior lateral nucleus goes to the cerebral cortex via the superior thalamic radiations the superior thalamic radiations course through the posterior limb of the internal capsule and the centrum semiovale to reach the cortex so as you can see in the sensory unit figure above the thalamus and represented by dark blue line we find the superior thalamic radiations the superior thalamic radiation transmit conscious sensation as we previously mentioned to the cerebral cortex 
at the cerebral cortex, the area occupied by conscious sensation is just behind the central sulcus. The area is called the primary sensory cortex, where we find the sensory homunculus, represented in this figure. Notice the large area occupied by the lips and the index finger. Notice the area of the head and that the lower extremities feel are in the mesial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. The primary sensory cortex in conjunction with single modality and multimodality association areas of the cortex are important for graphosthesis and stereognosis. Normal functioning of these cortices is assessed by the procedures used to evaluate these modalities. Just one more thing I'd like to mention. No talk about sensory examination is complete without talking about hysterical sensory loss. It must be stressed that hysterical sensory loss is a mental illness, a view not shared by 19th century physicians when this drawing was done. The job of the general physician is to recognize hysterical sensory loss, exclude organic conditions, and refer to psychiatry. Patients with hysterical sensory loss usually describe a sharp transition between feeling and not feeling. Patients with organic sensory loss usually describe a gradual transition between feeling and not feeling. Patients with hysterical sensory loss usually describe all modalities gone at the same level or at the same lesional margins. Patients with organic sen sensory loss usually describe different modalities gone at different levels or at different lesional margins. Patients with hysterical hemi body sensory loss usually describe to stop feeling the turning fork vibrate immediately after the turning fork is placed past the midline to the abnormal side. Patients with organic hemi body sensory loss usually describe to feel the turning fork vibrate immediately after it is placed past the midline to the side where other modalities are no longer perceived. Or not to feel vibration regardless of the site being tested. In conclusion, sensory examination is cumbersome and it is most subjective component of the neurological examination. Yet, anatomical and physiological knowledge and knowledge of the significance of the test being performed makes sensory examination a reliable and indispensable part of the neurological assessment. Thank you very much for your attention.